most of the literature on empire is kind of favorable toward empire. <laughs> it's kind of admiring of empire. That, you know, empires are seen as grand accomplishments, as bringing stability uh, where there had been chaos, uh, bringing peace and dominion among these uh, squabbling tribes, you know. You see that in those movies, too, you know. The greatness of Rome. You must remember Rome. And we were like, we're all supposed to be sitting there going, Rome, oh, whoa. <laughs> and those are my ancestors, you know. Um, <laughs> We even give empires peace names. Pax Romana, Pax Britannica. <laughs> empires are also often seen as, as innocent, unintentional accretions. They arise stochastically. Stochasticism, write it down, stochasticism is the theory that things happen by chance or random, that you can't see consistent patterns in this way. You know, just stuff happens. That's the way it is. Um, I remember in my, in my, uh, in my uh, salad days uh, hearing that the British Empire was put together in a fit of absent-mindedness. That, that used to be a phrase, used to hear that. I heard teachers say that to me. British historian Cyril Robinson, I quote him in the Caesar book, he says the same thing about the Roman Empire. Quote, it was perhaps almost as true of Rome as of Great Britain that she acquired her world domination in a fit of absence of mind. Yeah, right. More recently, or Robinson was writing back in the 1940s, I think. More recently, how about 2003, the Economist, an eminent conservative British publication, very eminent as you know, wrote the following in an unsigned editorial about, oh, in, in, um, in August 2003, about four months after the invasion of Iraq by U.S. forces, and this, this unsigned article was addressing that invasion, and it began like this. Empires are born in funny ways and sometimes via the law of unintended, unintended consequences by accident. <laughs> Empires are born by accident. There it is, accident. Well, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Empires are not innocent, absent-minded, accidental, unintentional accretions. They are given force by purpose-driven rulers who consciously have to mobilize vast amounts of men and materials to conquer and plunder far off places. I mean, the British just didn't just happen to find themselves in India, you know. Oh, look, fancy this. We were, thought we were going to go vacation in Greece and we took a turn and, well, we're here now. We might as well plunder the place and rip it all to pieces and get rich off it. The Philippines, yes, the Philippines. Was and I remember we said to the teacher, are those our colonies? And, and the teacher, Miss Myers, she said, America does not have colonies. Those are our territories. <laughs> What's in a word, hey? The power of labeling. So you didn't say, you didn't talk about, when I wrote my book, Against Empire, in 1995, there were a few people who commented, uh, Empire, come on, uh, Parenti, aren't you going over the top here? Talking about critique of U.S. interventionism, it's one thing. That's a bit much. The U.S. doesn't pursue empires. It propagates democracy, as we all know. But you know, but between, by, by 2000, 2001, suddenly all these books started coming out with the title of Empire in them. The Twilight of Empire, The Sorrows of Empire, The Follies of Empire, Empire at the Crossroads, Empire Gonna Get Your Mama, you know, I mean, every kind, every kind of, even conservatives started using the word. The conservative pundits who overpopulate the uh, Sunday talk shows and all these panel shows, uh, you know, opinion panel shows, they were all starting to say things like, we're an empire? And we've got to accept the fact we're an empire, and we've got to start acting like an empire. It's time we started acting. 
uh, and we've got to take on the responsibilities. It's as if, since we have this power, we have the entitlement. That power gives you moral, some kind of moral entitlement to go out there and whack other countries if you want. Um, well, I started asking myself, how is it? How is it that so many people now suddenly feel free to talk about empire when they mean U.S. empire? Not the wicked Soviet empire, or the British empire, or the Mongol, or Persian empires. No, no U.S. empire. How, how is it they're saying this? What am I missing? And I realized it wasn't something that I was missing. It's something that they were missing. That is, I realized that the word had been divested of its full meaning. Empire seems to mean, when most of these people write about it, it means simply dominion and power. What is missing from the public discourse is the process of empire and, even more important, the political economic content. For while we say a lot about this word, everybody's using this word now, empire, there's another word that's missing. There's another word that's missing that's very closely related to empire, and nobody ever uses it except a few of us. And that other word is imperialism. Now, isn't that fascinating? How can you talk about empire without ever mentioning imperialism? Because imperialism is the process of empire. Empires do imperialism. That's what they do. They do imperialism. It's like going to a medical conference of pulmonary specialists and they're all talking about our lungs and never once mentioning breathing. You know, so you've got to say, what is missing from this picture? Well, <clears throat> imperialism is not only the process, it's the political economic content. Imperialism is when the ruling interests of one country expropriate the land, the labor, the natural resources, and the capital, and the markets of another country. Imperialism means plunder and tribute. I I empires are not just all about power. It's not power for power's sake. Nobody goes out and just goes and does power. Oh, let's go to Africa and conquer chunks of Africa because then we'll feel more powerful. You know, you go to Africa because there's something there that you want. It's one of the richest places in the world. That's where you got, I mean, tin, copper, diamonds, gold, hemp, uh, timber, human beings, slaves, all the stuff that enriches you. That's what King Leopold, he didn't have any grudge about the people in the Congo. He didn't care one way or another about who they were, where they were, whether they lived or died. He just wanted them and work them in those mines so that he could get richer and richer and richer. So it's not power for power's sake. It's power to get your wealth and using your wealth to increase your power and using your power to maximize and secure your wealth. That's what it's about. That's what the guys who are in the White House today are doing. So... It's plunder, it's tribute, it's these rich resources. It's expropriating the land, the crops, the cheap labor. Empires are enormously profitable, mostly for the ruling and investing class of the imperial country. Empires are enormously costly for the common populace, both of the targeted country and of the imperial country itself. The empire feeds off the republic's resources. Where the hell do you think this empire comes from? It comes from the republic. Where do they get these? Where do they get the money for these 380 military bases and these bombings and killings and shootings and, and destruction? They get it from our tax dollars. The people pay the taxes and do without essentials so that the patricians can pursue their far-off plunder. The center is bled so that the perimeter can expand and expand and expand. And you see that happening. We live in a country that has a runaway defense budget just this past year, $487 billion. That's just the basic Pentagon defense budget. It doesn't count another $124 billion for Iraq, another 30 or $40 billion for Afghanistan. 
And at home, what do we have? We've got public hospitals closing. We've got libraries cutting back their hours. We've got goddamn sound systems that don't even work. <laughs> now you know why I'm angry. <laughs> we've got conservation programs being cut. We've got Medicare under siege because we can't afford it. And we, we can't afford it. Where are we going to get all that money from? I've got to work on my George Bush imitation, I know. <laughs> We've got education funding being cut back. What they do in the world, U.S. rulers, they do on purpose. They know what they're doing. Just because they mislead you and confuse you or us doesn't mean that they are necessarily confused. They may say all sorts of misleading things. A political writer, Lawrence McGuire, he sent me his article. I wrote, I wrote a piece. Maybe I should tell you about this. Am I going too long? You want me to stop now? Other people have spoken. All right. <laughs> I wrote an article and you can, uh, it's not on my website, but Common Dreams has it posted. It's called Mystery. How Wealth Creates Poverty in the World. And I pointed out that as U.S. investment has increased over the last half century um, dramatically in the third world, and, and U.S. and IMF and, and, and World Bank loans have increased in the third world, and U.S. aid to the third world has increased. While all of this has gone on for half a century, during that half a century, poverty has increased. Today, the number of people living in poverty is growing at a faster rate than the world's population. So as wealth accumulates, poverty spreads because there's a dynamic interrelation between the two. And I said, so here's the mystery. Why is that a mystery? It's such a conundrum. How do we figure this out? Well, there's no mystery, really. Unless you assume that these investors and these aid people and these bankers manipulating this debt are doing all this to help the people in these countries, if you drop that assumption and you say they're doing it to help themselves, then it's a perfectly rational system. They're making tremendous amounts of money. These investments aren't designed to uplift the people, to build up their domestic industries, to give them a viable economy, to make their food supply secure and those things. These investments are there to get them off the land, to take the wealth out of them, to reduce their, the price of their labor down to shantytown starvation levels. And so is the aid. The aid, the aid you, all these countries have to buy it from the U.S. And so with the debt, the loans, the loans are sent in and then they're trapped in the loan and then, then they're hit with more money sent to them and they're forced to do SAPs, it's called SAPs, Structural Adjustment Programs, which means cut back on all your own domestic subsidies and, and development and all that. So, so, so these programs are designed to impoverish these people and they've been very successful. And the liberal critic comes along and says, this isn't working because he's smarter. He's so, so, so much smarter than all these people who have been doing this all this while. No, he isn't. He's the dumbest one in the room. He always thinks, he always thinks that American foreign policy is so stupid and so confused and our dealings with these countries are, are on, off on a wrong leg and all that. Why? Well, Larry McGuire writes to me, he says, I loved your article. And it answered the question that I posed in mine. And I wish I could just read his piece because I liked his piece. I wrote him back. But he, he was trying to understand international finance and what happened in Argentina. And he read three liberal writers. He read Mark Cooper of The Nation. Mark Cooper, who never, who never met a U.S. war he didn't love and support. And, and um, he supported the destruction of Yugoslavia, a viable social democracy. He supported the Gulf War. He supports this war in Iraq right now. Uh, Mark Weisbrot and Paul Krugman of the New York Times. All of them, all three of them writing about Argentina. And McGuire, with feigned innocence, he notes that all three said that Argentina had been a gold mine for international investors and big speculators. 
a source of huge profits. You remember when Argentina crashed, when the whole economy went into a burnout. It just went down some years ago. Um, this is what we're talking about. The IMF forced Argentina to slash its protective tariffs, privatize its state enterprises, and transfer huge sums from Argentine taxpayers to the pockets of the big money people and the IMF. McGuire, he notes that Cooper, Weisbrot, and Krugman condemn the crisis in Argentina, that these three say that the IMF, and these are various quotes, created a failed model, the program was an error, a catastrophic failure, a failed experiment, a disaster. But McGuire says, how so? Agreed it was a disaster for the Argentinians uh, and for Argentina. Uh, but the free market IMF policies made Wall Street cheer, as Krugman himself said, and it wreaked billions for investors. In other words, the policy worked very well for a small group of very wealthy people. Isn't that what the policy was supposed to do, McGuire asks? The IMF has pursued these same policies in many other countries. If an institution does the same thing over and over again with profitable results, why is it a failure? Because it brought hardship to the people of these countries? What's that got to do with getting rich? As McGuire says, I quote him, I would call it a well-crafted policy that must work for the people implementing that policy. Otherwise, why would they continue doing it? What's experimental about it? It's been done, it's been, they've been doing it for 40 years. What do you mean? It's a, Krugman called it an experimental policy that's gone wrong. We've got to stop it. Um, so why do Cooper, Weisbrot, and Krugman call it a failure. I'm going to tell you why right now. This is why you paid your 10 bucks. Now's the moment <laughs> you're going to hear the real lowdown. What was the question again? <laughs> why do they call it a failure? They call it a failure because they want to stay within the dominant paradigm. They prefer to make a liberal complaint rather than a radical analysis. They assume a community of interest between the plutocratic investors and the working people of the recipient countries, when in fact there is no community of interest between those two. These three have no class analysis of the IMF. They assume that the rich plunderers who make billions off the IMF are primarily interested in helping others rather than in keeping themselves, rather than in helping themselves. They avoid all mention of that old Roman uh, question, cui bono, that's Latin. It means what? Who, benefits. who benefits, that's right. Who's getting it? Who's benefit? This is being done because somebody is benefiting it in most cases. Now the same for the war in Iraq that the reasons given by the administration to justify that war, weapons of mass destruction, Al-Qaeda links to uh, Hussein, that, that these reasons have proven false, doesn't mean that the policy is imbecilic. As I said to you already, because our, 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 our rulers try to mislead us and confuse us, doesn't mean that they themselves are confused. The war in Iraq Ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, the war in Iraq is not a stupid blunder. It's not a well-intentioned undertaking that went wrong. Iraq has been very good for a number of interests. It served notice to the Middle East and the world that countries that chart an independent, self-defining, self-developing course will be destroyed. That's just what Cheney said yesterday on that aircraft carrier about Iran, that it might try to emerge as a regional power, and we've got to make sure that doesn't happen. 
There are really very disturbing things about Iran. You know, you have a new literacy rate of up to 80 percent. The social wages being built up. They're recycling oil profits it, right back into the economy in some cases. Many, many things wrong with Iran, especially with the condition of women. I'm not trying to say that's a society we should aspire for. But what bothers them is that here's a country that's charting an independent course. It's not putting itself under the free market global system. And that's what was wrong with Iraq. Saddam Hussein, and here's something, if you want to look at amnesia in the media, Saddam Hussein was Washington's poster boy years ago. The Iraqi people had a revolution in 1958 and they kicked out the British and American oil companies and they built a, a democratic country. When Every time they talk about we've got to go in there and teach the Iraqis democracy, there's a lie. There's the lie of omission. They forget that they had a democracy. They had a constitutional government, a prime minister. Saddam Hussein's first gig with the CIA was to shoot the prime minister which he did. He didn't kill him. He just wounded him. And the CIA got him out and brought him to Syria. He later on worked his way in and with his death squads he killed or he drove into exile or he drove underground. Every constitutionalist, every progressive, every reformer, every democrat, every communist in the country who had formed this coalition. He even then killed and slaughtered and murdered the whole left wing of his own Ba'athist party. This is the part they never tell you about Saddam Hussein. And, then when, and, while, and when he was doing that, he was Washington's poster boy. They loved him. They gave him aid. They gave him a good chunk of the oil market. They gave him, uh, they signed him on Iran to go fight, do a proxy war for them against Iran. He was everything. But then he started committing economic nationalism. He kept the economy state-owned. He trained cadres of engineers. He did not turn Iraq into a free market client state. He did not open it up to global international investment. He did not say, come on in, boys. It's all yours. The land, the labor, the, the resources, the oil, everything. It's all yours. Just give me and my brother uh, Jose or, or Abdul, whatever part of the country it is, the, the client, client leader will say, just give me and my brother Pierre a uh, uh, payoff and all that and we'll take care and keep the people in line for you. Um, he didn't do that. He was, he was a, a right wing of conservative, but he did keep a lot of these social programs anyway. That didn't fit very well. Iraq was the example he was, it was a bad example for the Middle East. It was the example, the danger of a good example. We, we, we call it that. Um, if every country in the Middle East starts doing that, or in the world, what happens to the empire? What happens to our free market global system of earning billions and billions and billions of dollars off the sweat, labor, and land and resources of these people? So that was accomplished. You see, this war did accomplish something. It took an independent, self-defining, self-developing country and destroyed it. It may making the world that much safer for the free market global empire. If you want to know what kind of empire the U.S. has, it's a free market empire. Iraq was good for other people. A hundred companies made billions in government contracts. Most of them are getting out now because the situation is becoming so untenable. 113 billion barrels of quality crude. At, at today's prices, we're talking about six or seven trillion dollars. The biggest resource grab in history. Sudan, Saddam, who's, Saddam was, was, was uh, granting concessions to Russia, China, Brazil, Italy, Malaysia, France. All those concessions are, no longer exist. They're gone. It's the U.S. and Great Britain this last March, the accords they worked out. If and when they want to get all that, they get all that oil out. A lot of it is also to keep the oil off the market to keep the oil prices up. And that was the fight, the first Gulf War with Daddy Bush, that, that's what the whole fight was. That Saddam wanted a larger oil quota um, and he wasn't getting it. 
and, and, and if he did, that would bring oil prices down. That's not my conspiracy theory. That's not my lefty conspiracy theory. That was right in the goddamn New York Times business page. It just said, uh, uh, Iraqi oil might threaten price, price floors, blah, blah, blah. Um, oil concessions were taken away from these other countries. Okay. <clears throat> The Iraq War also allowed the U.S. to impose, the White House to impose record increases in the defense budget by 30, 40 percent, depending on how you calculate that defense budget. Iraq had switched from dollars to euros as its reser reserved currency, that is the currency that any other country will take, it's your backup currency. Um, not anymore. That was a danger. That was a real danger to, to U.S. Uh, creditors and speculators and, and international dollar finance, which um, it's back on the dollar. One of the first things that happened is Iraq has switched back from euros to dollars. Iraq supported Palestinian liberation. Not anymore. Um, Iraq had an entirely state-owned economy. Not anymore. Everything has been privatized or destroyed one way or the other. Iraq was prosperous and of some influence in the Middle East. Not anymore. Iraq today is a total basket case. It's a disaster. It's worse than Haiti. It may never recover, not, not, uh, not for the next foreseeable one or two or three generations. I don't, I don't know. It's just terrible what's happened. Um, Iraq, all right, that's it. Now, this is not U.S. ignorance or confusion at work. This is not good intentions gone awry. It is deliberate, conscious reactionism and imperialism. Um, Bush and Cheney knew what they wanted to do, and they have done it for the most part. It's true they did miscalculate. It's true they thought the uh, insurgency would be minor, that people would, uh, they may have even convinced themselves that people were going to throw flowers out and greet them and all that. It's true they got a politically costly war uh, that they didn't expect to have. But that, that doesn't mean they didn't accomplish anything. They've accomplished quite a bit from their perspective. And the empire can lose the war, that is, go home after it's destroyed the country. That's what happened in Vietnam. I don't think they lost the war in Vietnam. Vietnam never really recovered. It now has to take a capital road. Uh, I was in Vietnam two years ago, and they're telling me that the third generation is suffering from more birth deformities than ever as the you know, recessive genes combine from the, all the Agent Orange that went in there. And you, and you can see it. See. I've seen photographs of monster births that you don't ever want to see. You just don't ever want to see. And these kids are alive, too. Um, and so I'm almost done. Uh, this brings us to another question about how to think about how we think. Do those who put forth the lies of empire believe what they tell us? Sometimes yes, sometimes no. You know, that, a, that an opinion serves my self-interest doesn't mean that I embrace it hypocritically. It, it might mean because it so well serves my self-interest that what? I embrace it all the more eagerly and sincerely. I believe it. It might be double-think. It seems very persuasive for the very fact that it's so serviceable. So, do they, do these people in the White House, do they believe in the dominant paradigm? They sure do. It defines their world for them. It assures them of their self-worth. They believe, along with one of their progenitors from two centuries ago, Alexander Hamilton, that the country should be run by the rich and the well-born. And it should be run for the rich and the well-born. They completely believe they are deserving of their station in life. It's called Yale, Harvard, Princeton. As has been said, George Bush Sr. was born on third base, and he grew up thinking he had hit a triple. They believe that America should lead the world and that they should lead America. 
and they believe the poor are the authors of their own poverty. Just listen to Barbara Bush when she holds forth on that. And the working class are a troublesome lot who need to be reined in along with the middle class, both of whom have to ratchet down their standard of living and their level of expectations a lot more so that the people at the top can get still richer. See, there's only one thing that ruling classes have ever wanted throughout all of history, and that's everything. <laughs> they want all the best lands, all the resources, all the grains, all the herds, all the gold, the silver, everything. They want all the comforts and protections of civil life, and, none of, and all the amenities and while, have, while having to pay none of the costs. They want everything. They want you to have all the burdens, and they want all the privileges. Now, do they believe the propaganda they put out in support of specific policies? Well, sometimes they do deliberately fabricate and seem to be aware of it. You know it when you catch them in inconsistencies, when they say one thing one day, another thing the next day. I mean, Alberto Gonzalez, you know, and he said, I didn't know about it. Oh, yeah, I knew about it. Oh, yeah, this. Well, it wasn't that much. Well, it was that. Well, I don't know, you know. Um, I can't remember. Well, you know that. You know when they suffer from amnesia, they have amnesia problems. He he couldn't remember what. What was it about sixty-five times or something? John Mitchell during Watergate. He 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 had memory problems about one hundred and twenty times. I don't uh, and I don't know or I can't remember about one hundred and twenty times. And you can go on with these things. Um, much of the time, though, truth is not even a consideration. It's more like the advertising world. Advertisers don't strive to create truths. They strive to create a sale. The prime consideration is selling a product, not the truth. The question you ask is, will it sell? That's the truth. If it sells, then it's, quote, true, in heavy quote marks. Is the message effective? Is it getting across? If it works, then it's true, and we'll go with it. If it doesn't, then it's discarded. The approach is purely instrumental. Truth is a purely instrumental thing. Does it serve our ends or not? Ta I'll give you a recent example of that. The recent propaganda line of, you people want to cut and run, but we want to stay the course. We're going to stay the course. Do you, know, do you know that the Bush team has dropped that phrase, stay the course, because they found out that the public didn't like it. It sounded like we're going to be there forever. And, and people are asking, what's your plan? What's your game? What's your exit uh, uh, plan? You know? And uh, so they dropped, stay the course. Now, was it true? Were they being sincere when they said stay the course? Or are they being sincere now when they dropped it? You go figure. Um, at what exact psychological point the self-serving, manipulative, lying sentence is believed by the liar himself is, is something that may be hard to locate, um, and it's really not all that important. Um, <clears throat> Do they believe in their own virtue? Yes, of course. All people, all parties, all national leaders, all movements believe in their own virtue. But even more so, more than anything else in the world, more than truth, more than uh, if this is a real question in their mind or not, more than all of that, with the utmost ferocity and dedication and determination, they believe in protecting and advancing their own interests. That's what they believe in. If you want to know what they believe in, that's what they believe in. If you want to know what their religion is, it's not Jesus Christ, it's that, what I just said. It's, it's Jesus' wallet. Um, but there is, let me finish by saying, there is room for hope, brothers and sisters. <laughs> there is room for hope. There's some, there sometimes are limits to how well officialdom and the corporate press can finesse reality. Sometimes reality keeps getting in the way. I was talking to somebody, uh, this was years ago, a young, young guy who, who had been in Germany. He had been a school kid in Germany during World War II. And I said, well, did you believe all this stuff? He said, well, you know, after a while, propaganda can go just so far. Because we kept hearing about the victorious 
German armies were vanquishing our foes and going across. But we kept noticing that the battles were being fought all closer on the map, on the, the battles were being fought closer and closer to Germany's borders. And then the battles were being fought inside Germany, and we realized that our armies were in retreat, and, um, and that, we, in fact, we were losing the war. And something of the same reality principle applies to Vietnam and Iraq. Officialdom and the lapdog press could not totally ignore the awful and persistent actuality of the war. And that reality, that reality sets the limits, is itself the limits of propaganda. It's the limits of propaganda itself. That's as far as you can go. I mean, however, even in those cases, even in the case of the debate about Iraq today, the dominant paradigm still, still envelops it. Because the debate, and it was true of Vietnam too, in Vietnam the debate was between those who said we could win the war and those who said we could not. Those of us who said that's not even the question, we should not even be fighting this horrible war. If we won it will be all the worse. Um, this war doesn't represent the interests of the Vietnamese people. It doesn't represent the interests of the American people. It's a horrible crime against humanity. Those of us who said that did not get in the mainstream debate back in the 60s and 70s. And that's the same thing is happening, you see, with Iraq now. This, is, this thing's gone wrong. It's a failed policy. This, now, let's get the hell out. And blah, blah, blah. The implication is if it had gone better, if we killed more people at the right time, it would be perfectly all right to be there. So keep in mind one thing, that indoctrination into the dominant paradigm does not operate with perfect effect. If it worked with perfect effect, you would not be able to understand what I was saying now. I would not be able to say what I'm saying now. Um, I would be saying something else. This would be a Republican National Committee meeting or something. <laughs> In the face of all monopolistic ideological manipulation, people still develop a skepticism toward the official ideology. Reality is a problem for the ruling class. Remember that. Reality is a problem for them. Reality is not a problem for us. They are the ones who have to finesse reality and misrepresent reality. Reality is radical. Just remember that. When, when we say that there's terrible environmental devastation, that's not something we are conjuring up out of our radical ideology. That's reality, you see. When we say poverty is growing faster than the world's population, that's reality. That's not, that's not, um, that's not some argument we're making, you see. When we're saying that wages are flat and the top fraction of 1% is making more money than they ever did before and they've got these immense multi-billion dollar tax cuts, that's not something we, we imagined. That's reality. And they have got to deal and explain that. When we say that Social Security has been the most successful, successful human service program that this country has ever produced, the most successful anti-poverty program, as inadequate and insufficient as it is, and it's a three-pronged program, remember, it's not just pensions, it's not just pensions, it's also disability insurance, and it's also survivor's insurance. Um, that's reality. And those, and those hooligans have to lie. They have to tell you they're concerned about Social Security. They don't want to see it. Uh, go defunded, and he said, what we'll do? We'll just break it up into little pieces and toss it into Wall Street. And people don't buy it, you see. You can, uh, when, when George Bush said, and I've heard him say, we have the best medical system in the world, the most advanced medical system in the world, and you've got 40 million people out there, do you know what it means to face a major illness without any health insurance? Yeah. Right, you do. I do too, ma'am. I remember going for an epidural shot in my back. I had this terrible thing, a procedure that took all of five minutes. Now I've got a captive audience. I'm going to, you listen to my problems here. <laughs> five minutes it took, a half hour on a gurney 
not even in a room, it was in a hallway that, where the gurneys were separated by a sheet on a thing, you just pull it around. Uh, and then, and then uh, a friend of mine came and she drove the car up and helped me into a wheelchair and got me home. That, that, you, know what they, you know what they charged me? They charged me $5,740.80. What's the 80 cents for? I mean, what is this? So when somebody says to you, we've got the best health care system in the world, um, it's best for, somebody. for somebody, there are parts of Walter Reed Hospital that work very well for the president and the vice president, but not for the, not for the foot soldiers who are sent out to defend the empire. So that shows you their class concern and their class perspective. Um, so when reality is radical, there's a limit to how many lies people can swallow about the reality that they're experiencing. All social institutions, um, all social institutions of capitalist society have a dichotomous tension within them. They must sustain the few and advance the interests of the few while appearing to serve the many. Along with ruling class coercion, we have mass resistance and skepticism. Along with institutional stability, we have popular ferment and popular innovation and resistance at times. Don't you ever think for one moment that they don't care what you think. They don't care what you think. Oh man, that, that's, the, that's the only thing about you that they care about what you think. That's what they're doing. Cheney's trip to that aircraft carrier and all that stuff. Every day, every day they're putting on a show. They're waging their propaganda war. Not in Iraq, not in Latin America. They're too, yeah, they have a U.S. Uh, US uh, agency of information, what is it called? Information, AI, yeah. They have that stuff. But the, the country, they, they, the place they target most with all their propaganda, most of the things they do are directed to the American public because the empire feeds off that republic. Uh, so they lie and they conjure false issues to distract or flatter or frighten the people or in some other way to win over and immobilize the public. Or sometimes when they have no choice, they have to actually make real concessions to democratic demands. Years ago, the American philosopher William James observed how custom and culture can operate as a sedative, while novelty and dissidence are rejected as an irritant. Yet I would argue that after a while, sedatives can become suffocating and irritants can enliven. People sometimes hunger for the discomforting perspective that gives them a more meaningful explanation. By being aware of this, we have a better chance of moving against the tide, a better chance of resisting the deadening hand of fundamentalist free market plutocracy, a better chance of exposing the dominant paradigm for the sinister, suffocating, dirty little box that it is. Thank you, brothers and sisters. <clears throat> Welcome to Antioch University, Seattle, and uh, welcome to uh, the Center for Creative Change. The context is 155 years of history of Antioch College and Antioch University, which was founded in uh, Yellow Springs, Ohio, in 1852. It was founded with the first regularly appointed female professor in any uh, college or university in the United States. Antioch has a history of graduating students who continue the struggle for social justice, today economic and environmental justice, and for making a difference in the world. So the Center for Creative Change here at Antioch, Seattle, is one of the current manifestations of that historical tradition from Antioch. We have five master's degrees programs aimed at helping people become change agents. That is our mission, to help people in organizations and communities throughout our country and increasingly throughout the world as we develop international programs to become change agents, thus 
the five degree programs, whole systems design, management, environment and community, strategic communications, and organizational psychology all involve students in doing change projects in order to receive their degrees. And to prepare them for that, we teach how to learn from experience, which may seem a little strange in an educational, a higher education institution. So we are talking about moving ourselves as a university and higher education into the 21st century in order to help people learn to be effective learners after they leave us with the skills to learn from their experience. That's a key element of our curriculum and it pervades all of our courses. The Center for Creative Change brings together here at Antioch Seattle the historical mission which is to help our students and we as faculty make a difference in the world. Thanks very much for coming.